Uh, this morning, uh, as you are probably aware, Pastor is in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, going, or he's on his way to Cleveland, Ohio, uh, which is going to another Parkside church. Um, we're, uh, we're very blessed, however, because uh, the, uh, the message this morning is going to come from Dennis Fuquay. Uh Dennis is originally from Gig Harbor. Um, and he received his uh, Bachelor of Arts and Master's of Divinity degrees from Moldoma. He served as a pastor at the Insula Christian Fellowship in Gate Harbor for 24 years. Uh, but his, so I've known him uh, since he's come and talked to the men's group a couple of times. Uh, he has a real passion for prayer. In fact, I would indicate that Dennis is uh, a prayer warrior. And uh, in fact, the, one of the prayer books that we got, uh, that we're, we went through, uh, Dennis uh, authored, or at least was involved in the authoring of that book. And so it's a real blessing to have him come before us. Uh, I know he has a real passion for this. Uh, and uh, that he is uh, very passionate about the prayer. Uh, one of the uh, he's written some books, including the Living Prayer, founder of, uh, uh, and he's the uh, uh, as well as uh, he's the founder of the Clark Clark, uh, Clark County Prayer Connect. Uh, I believe he's the director of Inter International Review uh, Renewal Ministries. Um, so it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dennis uh, to bring us the message this morning. Dennis, thank you. <clears throat> Great. Well, with that, with that introduction, let's just close in prayer, shall we? <laughs> Appreciate that. Good to be with you again. I've had the privilege of being here before, and it seems like every time I'm here, your pastor's gone. <laughs> what? Do you have a pastor? Yeah. Uh, I actually, I, uh, I think what happens is Daryl says, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm leaving. Now, my people need to hear what Dennis is going to say. Now, I don't need to hear what Dennis is going to say, but they need to do it. So, uh, no, it's a privilege to be here this morning and, and to share with you. And, and uh, I do have a passion in relationship to prayer and, and uh, share on that topic often. This morning, I'm going to share on a related topic. It's not, it's not directly on prayer. Uh, but don't tell anybody else that I preached a message not on prayer. That would not be a good thing. Um, this, this morning... What I'm going to share with you uh, comes from Psalm 1. That's why Bill read that passage. And, um, <clears throat> and it, like I said, it's, it's very related to prayer. Uh, but the, the deal is this, is that um, God just can't help himself. He's a blessing kind of a God. He just, he just longs to bless people, whether they deserve it or not. Turn to someone and say, whether you deserve it or not. Go ahead. It's okay for you to talk. Turn to someone and say, whether you deserve it or not, God is a blessing God. You think right back to, to, to Genesis chapter 12, when he called out Abraham. And the reason why he called Abraham out is he said, I'm, I'm calling you out because I want to bless every family on earth. And uh, Clark County Prayer Connect was mentioned. The reason why we've established that ministry sort of under the, under the umbrella of the larger ministry, International Renewal Ministries, is because there, there's two big things that drive us with Clark County Prayer Connect. Number one, number one, Jesus deserves to be worshipped by every person in Clark County. Amen. And he's not being worshipped by every person in Clark County. So until he is, we have a job to do. Number two, Jesus desires to bless every person in Clark County with the ultimate blessing of knowing Him, knowing the Father through the Son, being filled with the Spirit, uh, uh, walking in relationship with the triune God. What a, there's, there's no better blessing than that. And until, until everyone in Clark County receives that kind of a blessing, we still have a job to do. Are you with me? Amen? Amen. So, I've thought a lot about how we can receive the blessing of God. And Psalm 1 is a, is a, a key 
passage that tells us point blank, here's the people that God blesses. Here's how he blesses people. So that's why I've, my thoughts have gone to Psalm, Psalm 1 this morning. I'd like us to, uh, I'd like us to read it. No, uh, how, to, how to advance in your walk with God would be a subtitle of this, and I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But I want us to read it. I'm going to read the part that's not underlined, and you together will read the part that is underlined. Good. I just want to make sure we're, we're connected here, okay? So, um, blessed is, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor sit at the seat of scoffers, and in his law he meditates day and night, which yields its fruit in its season, <clears throat> together, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Look at the first, so the, actually, look at, look at the second word. Blessed. How blessed. And then look at the last word on the screen. Prospered. God is a God who just longs for people to have good, healthy, flourishing lives. And Psalm 1 is a place where he tells us very, very specifically, here's how this can happen. What I want to do first is I want us to go to, to verse 3. Look at verse 3. This, tell, this sort of describes what a blessed life would look like. <clears throat> Do you see, there, there are four specific things in Psalm 1, verse 3, that describe this blessed or this full or this abundant, this prosperous kind of life. The first one, it says this. The person who is blessed will be like a tree... Reminds me that when I turned 40, which let's just say was not last year, it's a long time ago, when I turned 40, someone gave me a t-shirt. You know what it said on that t-shirt? 40 isn't old unless you're a tree. Hmm. <laughs> I said, I think I'm supposed to say thank you for this. <laughs> So, but, but the person who's blessed will be like a tree, and he describes it very specifically, a tree that's planted by streams of water. There's a couple things that we can get from that. First of all, it's firm. A, a tree that's firmly planted. If you're a firmly planted tree, you've got a good root system. You know this thing of, of living a life in Jesus, we need a good root system. Roots do two things. They keep you from falling over. If you've got a good root system, you can stay firm and planted when other people fall over. In fact, uh, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus tells a story. Jesus tells a little parable about the person who is blessed because he has heard and responded to, what, to the words of Jesus. said, that person is like a wise person, or I like to say, like a wise guy. It's good, in some cases, to be a wise guy, right? So a wise man who, is, who has heard what Jesus said and responded, and when storms come, and when winds blow, and when floods come, that person's life is solid, we could say, because he's built on a rock. He's got a good foundation. A, a tree, a healthy tree that's planted by streams of water, has a good, solid foundation. The second thing that a good root system does is it, it's, it's the means by which we get nourishment. We get nourish, a tree gets nourishment from a root system. We get nourishment from our roots in Christ. As you're rooted in Him, you, can, you don't, don't ever let Pastor Darrell know that I said this. Okay? <laughs> Now you're all listening. <laughs> don't ever tell pastor this. But if you have a good root system, you don't need someone to come and teach you all the time. It's beneficial, yeah, but you don't need that because you're not waiting from Sunday to Sunday to get another bite. You're getting nourishment all the time. God's blessing looks like a person planted who's not shaken by, by, by uh, a, a variety of things, including circumstances, including bad teaching, etc., etc. They're firm, 
And they're, and they're getting their own nourishment on a regular basis. God wants you to be firmly planted. Pastor Darrell wants you to be firmly planted. I'd encourage you to, to, to see this as, a, as a dis, part of the description of, of, a, of a blessed life. The second thing that's there is, says, planted by streams which yields its fruit in its season. A fruitful life. A blessed life is a fruitful life. You think of the fruit of the Spirit. You think of the fruit of people coming to know Jesus. You think of fruit of, of a solid, of solid life, etc. The, the, the thing about fruit is this. I've never seen an apple tree eat an apple that it grew. Okay? The apple is always for someone else. The fruit that is born in your life is not primarily for you. I love what I, I love the, the first line of um, Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. It's not about you. This whole thing of living life in Jesus, the reason why he wants us to produce the fruit of love, the fruit of joy, the fruit of self-control, those, those nine fruit of the Spirit there, is he wants us to grow that so that other people can come and pick on you. <laughs> Pun intended. So, because because he, he wants he wants his life to get to that person, and the way that he can get his life, his love, his joy, his character to that person is to have them rub up against you and take something from you that they don't have. So, the fruit that you're growing is to be able is, is to give away, and a blessed life, a fruitful life, a blessed life has has fruit that is willing to be distributed, given away to others. The next line it says, and its, we it's, it's, weave. its leaf does not wither. Its leaf does not wither. There's this continual renewing thing that happens to the person who's blessed by God. They don't, they, they, it's, not that they, it's not that they grow a leaf and then that withers off and they take the next stage, okay? But rather there's this continual renewal, almost a supernatural kind of renewal thing because uh, here in the, in the Northwest we have lots of evergreen, but, but the deciduous tree is what's being described here, the tree that has leaves and, and typically those leaves would fall off and other other leaves would grow. But here he says a weird thing. He says the leaves will not wither. I hope that the things in your life that are solid when you're... I'm going to pick on you two girls right here, okay? So that I can pick on you real well. It's okay, because if you're producing fruit, I can pick on you. I just said that. Tell, tell me your first names. Yell real loud. Your first name? Yeah. <laughs> the, the one in the wazoo shirt. Sierra. Sierra? And? Gabby. 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 Sierra and Gabby. Okay? <laughs> now I forgot what I was saying. No, no. <laughs> Sierra and Gabby, listen. When you're as old as that person next to you... <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> there, <laughs> there are things that God wants... There are things that God wants to be fresh and green and leafy in your life right now that will still be fresh and green and leafy when you are not only a mother, but a grandmother and even a great-grandmother. There are things that God wants to be, pro uh, pro to be produced in us now that stay fresh all of the time. In fact, the message that I'm sharing here with you now, this is not a new message for me. This is a message that I have practiced for years and years. This is not a message that I prepared last week. This is a message that literally... I I've been preparing for about 45 years, okay? This, this whole thing that, uh, of, of Psalm 1. The fourth thing, it says, and, and, and whatever he does, he prospers. Now, the word prosperity in the Christian world today, uh, there, there's all kinds of things that people think about it. Don't, don't get hung up on, on anything else, but just, just this. God is a God who has enough. And he wants to give you more than enough. He's a God who, who, who knows relationships. And he doesn't want your relationship just to survive. He wants your relationship to thrive. He knows how parents and kids are supposed to get along. And he wants you to enjoy that process. He knows that, that you need finances. And he wants to give you enough finances. He, he's a God who wants you to live in genuine biblical prosperity. And don't, don't take that in some kind of a weird context, but it's just, it's just very simple. God wants to give you more than what you need. 
since my wife is not here this morning, it's safe for me to say that when she gets home from the church that she's at this morning, we don't always get along, and so she has to go to one church. No, that's not true. When, when, when she's going to walk in, and she's going to see a lavender plant. Okay? And that lavender plant, the reason why I bought that particular lavender plant is because it's got lots and lots of blossoms on it. It doesn't just have one little blossom on it. It doesn't just have one little thing that I can say, okay, Marilyn, I thought of you, and, and here's, here's the lavender plant, or lavender blossom. No, no, no. There's, a, there's more blossoms on that plant than what are needed. And that reflects the nature and the character of God. He gives us more than what we need. He doesn't just want us to sort of scrape by. He gives us more than what we need. So that's sort of the, the blessed life. It's a life where we're firmly planted. It's a life that produces fruit. It's a life of continual renewal. It's a life of prosperity, of good, uh, real biblical prosperity. So then, how do we get there? What are the steps to get to that, ki that kind of a blessed life? It's not a secret that we looked at verse 3. Now let's look at verses 1 and 2. This is how we get to verse 3. This is the most, you know, the most theologically significant thing I'm going to say this morning, is you get to verse 3 by going through verses 1 and 2. How are we doing? Are there any questions? Okay, you get, you, you get to a blessed life by doing what he says in verses 1 and 2. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of his wicked, etc. What I want to do at this minute is this. I want to take a little bit of a diversion, and I want you to read the first line with me up until the last two words of the first line. Just read the, the fir, up until the last two words. Where, don't read the, word walk, the words walk in. And read them real slowly. How blessed is the man who does not. You know, there's a phrase that goes around in, 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 our, in our world, our Christian world, that says something along the lines of this. You know, this thing of Christianity is it's not, it's not about do's and don'ts. Really? It's not about do's and don'ts? Well, I think what that is, is it's an abbreviation of a, tr of a, of a real truth, but when we just focus on the abbreviation, we miss the big truth. Okay? I I'm here to tell you, if you want to be blessed, if you want to advance in your walk with Jesus, there are things that you need to do, and there are things that you need to not do. Blessed, how blessed is the person who does not? There are things you shouldn't do, and there are things that you need to do if you want to make progress in your life with Jesus. Now, very, very clearly, this does not mean, and this is what this, this, is what this phrase, Christianity is not a, a list of do's and don'ts, what that phrase means, basically, what they're trying to communicate by that, or at least what they'd better be trying to communicate by that, is you don't establish a relationship with God by your works, by what you do and what you don't do. You don't establish a relationship with God by works. But if you want to advance in your walk with God, then there are things that you just simply need to do. And there are things that you better not ought to do. And one of the things that it says here is, the, the, first, the first line, the first verse, it says, don't receive input from bad sources. The, the definition of your character, I just heard this recently, I don't know if it's true, but I don't have to know if it's true or not, I'm just going to quote it. <laughs> the, the definition of your character is the average of the character of the five people you hang out most with. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but isn't that an interesting idea? In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says it this way, don't be deceived. Are there any questions here? Okay, pretty clear. Point blank. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Hang out with people who are going in the direction you want to go. Don't hang out with people who are going the other direction. Don't hang out specifically. Don't hang out with people. Don't receive influence from people who reject and spurn the Word of God. If you want to advance in your relationship with God, that is one thing that you need not to do. 
I want to come back and look at this word blessed. How blessed? Okay? This word, uh, it, it, it can literally be translated happy. But the, 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 the one particular word that I got in the, in the broader definition of the Hebrew word blessed is this. Is, is this word advance or to make progress. That's built into this word. Okay? <clears throat> you don't need to do anything except call out on Jesus to establish a relationship. He's gracious enough that he'll turn to the thief on the cross when the thief says, Jesus, please remember me. And he says, yep, I will. I'll do it. I'll do it. But if you, but if you want to make progress in your walk with Jesus, if you want to make a dent in the kingdom of darkness here in your world, if you want to contribute the life, the life of Jesus to people around you, there are things that you need to do. It doesn't happen automatically. It happens intentionally. So this psalm, among other things, is a psalm calling us to intentional intentionality. And the first thing that it calls us to do is don't receive input from bad sources. Chapter, uh, uh, um, verse 1. Let me read... If I can find my phone here, let me read um, Psalm 1 from the message. This is what Eugene Peterson does with Psalm 1. Psalm 1.1. 1, 1. How well God must like you. You don't hang out at Sin Saloon. You don't slink along Dead End Road. You don't go to Smart Mouth College. Isn't that a great way, a great fresh way of looking at that? Okay. Well, if you want to advance, if you want to be blessed, if you want to make progress in your, li in your, in your life with Jesus, one of the first things is don't hang out, don't be influenced, don't receive influence from people who disregard God's word. That will not get you where you want to go. The second thing to do, verse 2, is this. Do receive input from good sources. Do receive good input. Look for opportunity to receive input from good sources. Look for opportunity to be influenced by good books, good CDs, good messages, etc., etc. Look for good, good character. Look for opportunity to receive input from the people who are, who are now or who are on their way to where you want to want to go. And specifically it says, delight in God's word and meditate on God's Word. Delight in God's Word and meditate on God's Word. These two things, delight in God's Word and meditate on God's Word, are, are essential if you're going to advance in your walk with God. They're essential if you're going to, if you're going to make progress and be toward this life that is, is genuinely blessed. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. I just want to give you about six or so references, and we're not going to dive into each of, each of these, but uh, here, here are references. If you're a note-taker, jot these down. If you're not, no, not a note-taker, then memorize them. <laughs> uh, Psalm 1 and, and Psalm 112, 1. Uh, Psalm 1, verse 2, and Psalm 112, verse 1. We'll talk about how the, the blessing it is and, uh, uh, to delight in God's Word. The Psalm 119 verses basically all talk about loving the law of the Lord. And then uh, Jeremiah 15, 16. I once had a birthday cake from people in the congregation where I pastored, and it was decorated like a book, like a Bible, and it had Jeremiah 15, 16 written on it. The reason why they put that reference on there is this. It said, I found your word and I ate it. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> I, all right. That, that cake. It said, because it was my delight. You see, the things that I delight in, I think about. I delight in my wife. I delight in my grandchildren. Oh, my children as well. <laughs> uh, we, we've got, we've got, uh, we've got seven grandchildren, and two of them that aren't normally with us a lot. They live up in Lacey, are with us right now. And I have my youngest granddaughter is uh, is two and a half years old, and up until up until about this 
about three months ago or so, I didn't know if I actually had another granddaughter. I knew that my wife had a granddaughter, but I didn't know that I had a granddaughter because she just ignored me and always went to her. <clears throat> this weekend, I got a granddaughter. <laughs> she would come and snuggle up to me. In fact, I'll show you some pictures. Let, let me, uh, oh no. <laughs> but she would come up and snuggle up to me. We've had great, great times. So I have no idea why I said that and where I am in the message. Delight, <laughs> delight. Uh, when, you, when you delight in something, you think about that thing a lot. And so delighting in Scripture will lead you to something else. Delighting in Scripture will lead you to interact with Scripture. I believe it's, it's the, the ministry, the navigators, first came up with this thing. But I want you to look at your left hand, okay? Put your left hand, spread out the thing, okay? And point to pinky, okay? Point to pinky. These are five ways to interact with the scriptures. In fact, if you'd like, you can take out a sharpie and write on pinky right now. Just write right there, okay? That's hearing God's word. Hearing God's word is one way that you interact with God's word. The next one over is reading God's word. Reading God's word is more significant than hearing God's word. The next one over is studying God's word. Uh, studying God's word is more significant than reading God's word, which is more significant than hearing God's word. The next one over is memorizing God's word. Memorizing God's word is more significant than studying da da da. Okay? Thumbkins. Point to thumbkins and say meditation. What I said was, point to thumbkins and say out loud, meditation. meditation. Meditation on God's Word is the result of delighting in God's Word. Okay? If we delight in God's Word, we'll interact with it, and the best way to interact with it is to meditate on it. In fact, now watch, this is the, this is the key part of this illustration. The reason why I hear God's Word is to meditate on God's Word. The reason why I read God's Word is to meditate on God's Word. The reason why I study God's Word is to impress others with my knowledge of God's Word. Oh no, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just sort of slipped in there. The reason why I study God's Word is to meditate on God's Word. The reason why I memorize God's Word is to meditate on God's Word. Parents and grandparents, if you're not bribing your children and grandchildren to memorize God's Word, I challenge you to do that. What I do is, uh, I, I've said, I've told my grandkids and their, and their, their, adult, their parents, that I, I, I will give a gold dollar to, for every verse that those kids memorize, up to $1,000 a piece. We don't have that much money handy, okay? But I cannot think of a better way to invest a thousand dollars than to encourage my grandchildren to get the Word of God into their lives. But it's not about memorizing it. I'm, I'm, they're, they're memorizing it so they can meditate on it. That's the message that's been brewing in me for so long. So now, after the introduction of the message, let's get to the real message. Did I understand Daryl correctly? This is the service that gets over at 2.30? Is that? Am, am I? Are we on track here? <clears throat> it gets over at two thirty when he's not here. That's what it was. Okay. All right. I want. I want us to just go through and, and look at the, some things in relationship to meditation. My hope is this. My hope is that if you have regularly meditated on Scripture, you will be. A, you will do more than that. If you have not even heard of meditation and thought it was an Eastern thing that Christians weren't supposed to do, I pray that you'll dive into it. I don't care how old or young you are, this is the activity that I encourage you, I, 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 I charge you to grab hold of. This, more than anything else, will produce a blessed life in a believer's, uh, a blessed life in a believer. So, let's just look, what is meditation? According to Webster, meditation is just simply repeating something over and over again. It's reflecting, it's pondering, it's contemplating. According to just the just basic dictionary, those are some words that, that sort of describe what meditation is. So, when you, in fact, let me just say this very quickly. A key distinction between Eastern meditation, Eastern world meditation, and biblical meditation is this. Eastern world meditation, the goal of, of Eastern world meditation is to empty your mind and your spirit of stuff. 
The goal of biblical meditation is to flood your mind and your spirit with the Word of God. That's, that's the goal. I had a friend years ago who was saved out of the hippie movement, and he said the whole thing of meditation for him was, was the idea of you too can become one with nothing. <laughs> Well, this is not that. This is, this is God, and we've been talking about the law of God. When I say the law of God, I'm not just talking about the Ten Commandments. I'm not just talking about the Pentateuch. I'm not even just talking about all the commands of Scripture. I'm talking about what God says. Okay? God has spoken clearly. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. When God says something in his word, it's worthy for us to repeat that over and over, to think that over and over and over again, to ponder that, to, to meditate on it, to reflect on it, to contemplate on it. The biblical definition of this word, of this word meditation, the Hebrew definition, is it's related to taking medication. Okay? I may be giving you too much information here, but I have, I have gout. Okay? The, the medical condition of gout. And I'll tell you what, if you've never had a gout attack in your feet, you don't know what pain is. That just simply hurts bad. It just, it, it's almost, it's nearly crippling. So I take gout out. <laughs> I don't think that's actually what it's called, but that's what I call it. Uh, so, <laughs> and, and, and I take that many, I don't just, I don't just take one pill and say that, that ought to do it. Okay? I take that pill over and over again. And I take that pill every day. Uh, I, and I will continue to take that pill every day because I do not want to experience the consequence of not taking that pill. I want the benefit of painlessness in my feet that comes to me from that ongoing... So meditation is like that. It's taking... It's not just, oh yes, I meditated once. That ought to do it. Okay? No, no, no. It's, 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 letting the, the, it's letting, being washed by the water of the word. Another thing is, is it's, it's murmuring. The Hebrew word is related to murmuring. And this, this comes, uh, it's translated when the children of Israel are out in the desert, uh, they come out of Egypt on their way into the promised land, and the, things don't go the way they want, and so they murmur out there in the desert. So I'm convinced that all of you know how to meditate. Because you all know how to groan and complain. And, and you run that thing, you have that conversation with the person who isn't even there and not even listening. You have that conversation with them over and over in your head. Okay? Well, that's, that's the process of meditation. So here I have an invitation to you. Extract that content in, and input better content, in, input content in the Word of God, but keep doing the same thing. Instead of groaning, and complaining about what that person did or didn't do, or this, whatever this, uh, the driver next to you, or whatever it is. Okay, take that content out, put in biblical content, and you're meditating. Another one is is chewing a cud. You've probably heard this illustration before if you've heard about meditation. But this is a, it's a, the Hebrew word for chewing a cud is uh, is like uh, like the word um, uh, to meditate. And you know the story of a cow. How many cows? Excuse me. How many stomachs does a cow have? Four, okay? Well, were you raised on a dairy farm or something? Or how do you know? Okay. So, and, and a, chow, a cow. A cow grabs a bite of hay and it chews it. You want to chew with me? Okay? You can't. It's, you know, participation here. Chews a bit and then they swallow it. And then, no, no, don't do this part, okay? I'll just do that. You got to be experienced to do this part, okay? Then it comes back up and they chew it more. And it goes into stomach number two, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Meditation is like that. Meditation is chewing the cud, okay? And then a couple other illustrations that I've just, uh, uh, one is from James chapter one. Uh, it, there it says, it says, joyfully receive the engrafted word. The word engrafted, the, the word of God, what God says engrafted into us is a way that the word, the nourishment from the word gets into our system. How many of you have ever grafted a branch onto a trunk of a tree. Okay, good, good. Well, not many of you, so if I tell a lie here, just ignore me, okay? Don't, don't ruin my punchlines here. No, I think this is the way, because I might watch my parents do it years ago. What you do is you get, you get a, a trunk that has a good root system and a branch that has good fruit in it. And then you scrape off the bark of the 
root system and you scrape off the, the uh, end of the, the branch and you put that branch up against the, the, the trunk and then you wrap a, a cloth around it and put water on there. So you, how am I doing? Am I doing good so far? Okay, you, you put water on there so it keeps it damp and then you take some wires or sticks and, and use external means to hold that branch up against the trunk. And after a period of time, what happens is the sap from the trunk and the sap from the branch flow into each other and after a period of time it stays there and then pretty soon the fruit that is inherent in the branch will be produced. That is like meditation. You take the truth of God's Word, which there's good fruit in that verse or in that chapter. You take the fruit of that verse and you scrape off a, a, a chunk of the trunk of your old crusty life and then you hold that up there, you put it up against there, and then you take an external means. You take a rag or something and sticks, you, you, you take your mind, okay, and you pour water over that. The water of the Holy Spirit, you involve Him in the process, you, you invite the Holy Spirit in the process, and pretty soon, the fruit of that branch will, be, will begin to take hold of the, the, of the trunk of your life. And, and then the fruit of that branch will, will blossom and someone will be able to come and pick on you. <clears throat> Again, so the, the, that's, how, that's the process of engrafting. The Word of God is designed not simply to be read and said, Oh, that's a nice chapter. That's a, isn't that a nice verse? I like that verse. I'm going to write that verse on a, on a birthday card. Well, yeah, write the verse on a birthday card, but get it into your life. Take this Word of God and hold it up. Use external means and hold it up, not only against your mind, but against your spirit. Hold it up against you so that the sap from your life and the sap from the Word of God can mingle, and then the fruit that's inherent in, the, in that passage will get into your life. Another, another illustration <clears throat> is I think, of, I think of biblical meditation as spiritual swallowing. Spiritual swallowing. This afternoon we're going to have lasagna. You want to come on over? Yes. Okay. We're going to have lasagna. And, um, and I'm going to bite into that piece of lasagna. And when I'm chewing it, I'm enjoying the taste of the lasagna. And I'm appreciating my wife, who's a great cook. But I'm not receiving any nourishment from that lasagna as long as it's in my mouth. I only receive nourishment from that lasagna when I swallow it. When I go, did you hear that? Okay, that was a swallow. Okay, when, when, I, when I swallow that, then God has built in mechanisms into my body that I don't have to do anything more consciously. I have swallowed it. The gastric juices attack that thing, and eventually that lasagna is going to become pinky. It's going to become fingernail. It's going to become hair. Yes, I do have hair. Uh, it's, going to be, it's going to become muscle. I do have muscle, just to the, for the record. It's going to become blood. It's go, that, that lasagna is going to become who I am. Find the Word of God and eat it. And chew it and enjoy the flavor of it. And then swallow it. A spiritual swallow it can be done very, very simply. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That right there, that's what I want in me. That right there. Do that right there in me. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> there are a couple passages that I'd encourage you just to jot down. We're not going to take the time to spend there, but these are great passages that, uh, that talk about, <clears throat> that I sort of should say that illustrate um, meditation. The first one is Luke chapter 10. Now that's a PowerPoint right there. Did you see that PowerPoint? Okay. I just pointed and there it was right there. Okay. Um, Jesus and his disciples Mary and Mar uh, go to Mary and Martha's house and Lazarus' house. And here's the key thing. M Martha was distracted by all kinds of stuff, all the stuff that needed to happen. Mary did what? Mary sat at Jesus' feet listening to what he said. Saints, regularly sit at Jesus' feet and listen to what he says. And then swallow it. Say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. The other passage is in, is in Luke chapter 24. The resurrection day, Jesus was walking, uh, or a couple of disciples was walking on the road to Emmaus. 
Jesus shows up, has his conversation, and I, I, I just say, what, what are the verses here? Uh, yeah, t t 28 through 31. Just look at the, this is your homework assignment. Before next Sunday, because I'm going to have Daryl ask you, okay? Just kidding. But, but I would encourage you, read this passage and see, see what the Lord might show you about meditation. Sitting down with you, encouraging Jesus to stay. Jesus, we want you here in this process. And sitting down with him and letting him take what he's got and break it, give thanks to it, and give it to us. It's a wonderful passage. I want to give you three very specific words about the process of meditation. When I think of meditation, I think of three words. You will either, you will either write these down or memorize them. No question about it. One, one or the other, okay? You can, they're very easy to, to, to memorize. The process of meditation is this. Number one, ponder. Ponder. You can't meditate in a microwave. You meditate on the back burner Okay? You meditate, it's a slow process. You don't, you don't meditate in the drive through window. Okay? You meditate at, uh, what's a, at, a, at a restaurant where you go in and sit down and, and just take, a long, take an hour and a half to eat the meal. Okay? It's, it's a process. You can't, you can't do it quickly. Number two, personalize. Personalize the scripture. Now, I know what it says in the end of Revelation says you better not change the words of this book or you're in big, a whole heap of trouble. That's my version, my translation. Okay? I, but that's not what this is talking about. This is not changing it, this is applying it. So for example, 2 Corinthians 5.15, for example, says, He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. That's what the text says. So meditating, I would ponder through that. He, Jesus, you, Son of God, Son of God who willingly loved me, left heaven, came to earth, you, you, Jesus, you died for me. The only person who was worthy of life, you died for me. So changing the words there, what I mean is, is he died for Dennis, so that Dennis would no longer live for himself, but live for Jesus, who died and rose again on Dennis's behalf. Change or insert yourself, climb into the text. And then the third one is to pray it. Ponder, personalize, pray. Praying it from 2 Corinthians 5.15 would be like I was doing earlier. Jesus, I am so grateful that you love me so much that you left heaven, came to earth, died for me, and you did that for a reason. You didn't do it. I might be, I might be getting into heresy here, so just hang on. Don't tell Daryl. Uh, and, and you didn't do it just so that I'd end up in heaven. You did it so I would live differently here. Yes, I'm grateful I get to go to heaven, but you said you died for me so that I would no longer live for myself. God, today, today, help me not live for myself. Help me live for a far better reason, a far better person. Help me to live for you today, not me today. That's, that's praying it. So I want us to look again at Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. And I think it would be a little bit hypocritical if I preach for four and a half hours like I have this morning on this whole thing of meditation and then not, not giving you any opportunity to meditate. So, ponder, personalize, pray from these verses. Right now. <laughs> what I mean is this. I'm going, to give, I'm going to give you just a little bit of time. Not, not a long period of time. I'm going to give you just a little bit of time. Unless you have memorized, don't close your eyes. Just look up here and, and read it over and ponder a word or two. You don't, always have to, you don't all have to start at the beginning here, but ponder a word or two and then personalize that and then pray that. Okay? So I'll, give you, I'll be silent. You just go ahead for just a minute or two here.
Now let me interrupt you here. You know, uh, when you shop at Costco on a Saturday morning, you go to Costco and down at the end of the aisle there's a card table set up there and there's an electric skillet there and you've got some wild apple honey sausage or whatever it is that's, that's, that's be, they're being cooked there and they've got a bunch of little toothpicks there, right? And, and you, can, you can walk by and, and they want you to take a sample, right? Take a sample of that and you bite it and say, oh, I think that's pretty good. I think I better have another sample. Isn't that what you do? Okay, you take another sample and you eat it. Okay. My hope is that you've had a little, that a little bite of meditation this morning, with a toothpick in it. Okay. And you, you took that bite, and the guy behind the or the woman behind the card table is hoping that you'll go on over to the, the place on the shelf and you'll buy eight pounds of that, of that sausage. Right. My my hope is that from what I've shared with you this morning, these few minutes that we've had together, is that you would you would be renewed in or be exposed to this idea of meditation and say, I, I want I want more of that. Okay? More is available. More is available. It's it's at your doorstep. Now, I mentioned that I've been doing this for years and years, this whole thing of meditation. What I've shared with you really comes out of chapter 2 of the book that I've read, or that, that I've written that, some of, that was referenced earlier, called Living Prayer, the Lord's Prayer, Alive in You. And uh, so ch the reason why I put a section of medit about meditation in a book on prayer is because all the other stuff that I wrote about the Lord's Prayer flowed out of my times of meditating on it. So I, 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 uh, if you, my point is, if you'd like to get more information on that, I've got a few copies in there. 10 bucks a piece and you can get them afterwards if you'd like. If you want to buy one, it's $10. If you want to buy two, it's just $20. It just, it just works out like that, okay? Thank you very much for listening. I encourage you, grab hold of this. This, this is a game changer, okay? If you've done this on a regular basis, you know the value of it. If you haven't done it yet, it, it, this will make a huge difference in your life. This will advance your walk with God. You'll, you'll live a blessed life as a result of biblical meditation. Pray with me, please. Father, would you take my words, the words that I've shared here this morning, mix them in with your words from your word, and, and uh, let people, let the saints here grab hold of them. And... Uh, and my, my desire, Lord, is not simply that they would be blessed, but that you would be blessed because you see more and more people delighting in your word, meditating on your scriptures, and therefore qualifying for that blessing that you long to pour out. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.